On this week's episode, the tale of Richie Castucci, Revere Beach, the boys of Winter Hill, and the New York mob. You like apples? I like them apples. Welcome back, everybody, to the latest installment of my Tales from the Boston Underworld. Hope you guys like that new intro. Finally tapped into my creative music, um, the YouTube studio. Real quick before I get started, I want to give a shout out to my main man, Cordero, who a couple weeks ago requested a video about the underworld of Black Boston. I made it last week. He was very happy, but I forgot to give you a shout out. So there it is, Cordero, my main man. Also, real quick, shout out to the old boy, David Fishwick, who helped me out with a lot of research on the video that I'm doing right now about Rick, Richie Castucci. And this kid's research is just unparalleled, and he helps me out a lot. So big shout out to you, David Fishwick, one of my first viewers and subscribers. So without further ado, let's get into this story about Richie Castucci, Revere Beach, the Boston mob's favorite hangout, and his dealings with Winter Hill and the New York mob that led to his eventual and untimely demise. So Richie Castucci, the subject of this video, while not a made man, was very well connected in the city of Boston and throughout. He knew some of the most powerful people in the United States and the underworld. He was on a first name basis with Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr., Dean Martin. He owned several businesses in the city of Revere and was a very important person in the city, one of them being the Ebb Tide Lounge, which was the favorite hangout for the Boston mob in the 1960s for wise guys and people that were attracted to that scene. His uncle was Arthur Ventola, who owned Arthur's Farm, which was a it was flea market type place, but it was a notorious fence for stolen goods. Um, and he had tons of dealings with important people in the underworld in Massachusetts and beyond. So perhaps people that aren't from the Boston area or outside of Massachusetts aren't familiar with the city of Revere. Besides, the North End and East Boston, Revere had the highest concentration of Italian Americans in the Boston area. And it was central to the Boston rackets and the bars and nightclubs. In the 1950s and 60s on Revere Beach were the premier hangouts for the Boston mob and wise guys and clingers on to that lifestyle. So Arthur Ventola would have been a central figure in this scene in Revere owning Arthur's farm. And so his nephew Richie Castucci being part of the family um, and being around Arthur's farm as a child would be introduced to the rackets at an early age and would get kind of a head start through his family connections. So what do you think the odds of me making this video and not talking a little bit about the history of Revere Beach are? Very slim to me, I'd say. So Revere Beach, you might not know, is the first public beach in America. In July 12th, 1896, Revere Beach was made the first public beach and they had a ceremony and over 45,000 people showed up. I didn't know this, but originally... There used to be train tracks on the actual beach, and this um, landscape designer, Charles Elliott, who became famous after the fact, he ended up moving the train tracks back and restored the beach. The crescent-shaped beach stretched to Winthrop in the south and north to Nahant and Lynn, and people flocked there by the thousands to enjoy the fresh air, the ocean smell. Um, they started building amusement parks. I didn't realize this, but Wonderland, the dog track, was originally built to be a giant amusement park like Canby Lake. But the builders and investors didn't realize how much it would cost to up for the uptake of an amusement park that close to the ocean. Because the roller coasters during that time period were primarily built out of wood. And they were like rotting at an astronomically fast rate because of all the, all the salt in the air. And they didn't factor in this building an amusement park this close to the ocean. And within 10 years, it shut down. And it was later, I think, in the 1940s or 50s when they ended up allocating the land and making the Wonderland Dog Park. But I wasn't aware of this. But there was a lot of different um, roller coasters that were set up. And it became like a place just to go. Uh, people would go there on vacation. It 
It's an all around the Boston area. It became like a day trip place to go to. Um, there was arcades up and down. There was it was a family place to go back in those days. Uh, the whole idea of going to the beach was kind of new. A lot of people would show up to the beach like in their best like Sunday dress, you know, sitting in the beach with girls wearing big dresses and the guys all dressed up in suits. It's just kind of silly to think of it this time, but so it was just a place where the whole family could go and enjoy themselves. The kids could go to the Hippodrome, play some video games, go ride a carousel, while the parents could go to one of the clubs and listen to one of the big bands, play swing music and dance. And think what a different time that must have been back then where the kids could go by themselves and go play at the arcade and the parents could go to a place and have a couple drinks and dance. Like, I would never let my kids go anywhere alone nowadays. What a simpler time. So by the late 1950s, there was a seedier element that was starting to hang out along Revere Beach and its reputation was starting to change from being a fun family place with these amusement parks and it was becoming known as more of a mob hangout. And the bars, nightclubs, and lounges that used to line Revere Beach that no longer exist were a favorite of the Boston mob. And the flagship lounge for these mob hangouts was the Ebb Tide Lounge. And that was owned and operated by none other than Richie Castucci, Arthur Ventola's nephew. Now that you've indulged my history lesson for the video, let's get down to the good stuff that most of you's come to listen to. So Richie Castucci, although he was a prominent and successful business leader in the city of Revere, he was also involved in the rackets, mostly bookmaking. He had taken a couple calls earlier in his life. Um, once with a, it was like a group of guys and they were using a payphone in some parking lot in Walpole. And I think it's kind of funny now in the age of cell phones that the majority of bookmakers back in the day would center their operations around various payphones so they could be placing bets and taking bets while on the move throughout town and not be having it based out of a certain place like the house or office that could be easily surveilled. But a lot of these guys would get caught in like parking lots and public places while police were surveilling them using payphones. And that happened to Richie Castucci when he was younger. He got arrested with a group of guys while placing bets uh, around a payphone. Also another kind of interesting story too, he got arrested and detained one time while he was traveling in England and he was with a mixed group of American guys but the gist of the article, what I got was that they were like American kind of uh, underworld figures or mixed underworld figures and business owners and they were in London and they were at an illegal casino and I think that they were trying to invest in like illegal gambling over there in London and mix with the, the you know, the East End mobsters like the craze and stuff like that and the English authorities wanted to put a stop to that real quick. They didn't want any American criminal figures coming over to England starting trouble and mixing in with the criminals of the UK uh, so they were detained for a while their passports were held obviously eventually they made the case go away whether they paid it off or whatever and they were able to return to the United States but I thought that was kind of a little interesting story that Richie Castucci he was detained while traveling in England with a group of other Americans while they were frequenting a, uh, an illegal underground casino. By the late 1950s and early 1960s, Revere Beach was the favorite hangout for the Boston mob and the number one spot for wise guys and mopses was the Ebb Tide Lounge. Whitey even got arrested in the late 1950s. He walked in the Ebb Tide with a black dye hair job, thought nobody would recognize him, and that's where he got popped by Agent Rico and did his first federal bid out in Levensworth. But um, this was the hot spot for the mobsters in the late 1950s, early 1960s. So after he took some early calls in his life of bookmaking, he was involved in the rackets, but also, like I said, he was a successful and prominent business owner. He was connected, but he wasn't a made man in the patriarchal family, so he didn't get the same protections that a made man in the patriarchal family would get. So he started having trouble with one of the patrons in the bar. They were causing trouble, making a nuisance themselves. Um, he and his cousin, Nicholas Jr. Ventola, Arthur Ventola's son, approached the patron and tried to have a word with them. That patron was none other than Joe Barbosa, the Portuguese of New Bedford. And Barbosa was just a, a complete wild card. He didn't really care much for anything. He respected a couple guys, um, but <laughs> Richie Castucci was not one of them. And apparently he handed Richie Castucci, his cousin, Nicholas Ventola, and I guess even from things that I've read, the uncle Arthur was there too and tried to intervene and his nephew and son getting beaten and he got handed a beat himself so Joe Barbosa 
handed all three of these guys a beating, basically said, I'm not going to, I don't respect you. I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to come here to your bar and trash it every night and hand you guys a beating every day. So Richie Castucci was like, this is a serious problem. Like this guy's going to ruin my business. He's going to make me a laughing stock. He's got no respect. So he went to some guys who was basically looking for help. Uh, one of the guys that he went to was none other than Fat Vinny Teresa, and he said, "Hey, you know, Barbosa is coming to my bar. And he's, you know, he smacked me around in front of the patrons. He's embarrassing me. He's gonna ruin my business. I, I need your help." Teresa said, "I, you know, that guy is a lunatic. I don't want nothing to do with him. But I know somebody that he would respect and that could make this go away for you. But it's gonna cost you." And Rich Castucci basically was, "I'm willing to pay anything because if I don't fix this problem." I'm not going to have a bar anymore. My business is going to be done. So he introduced him to Henry, the referee, Tom Yellow, and this changed everything for Castucci. So by the early 1960s, Henry, the referee, Tom Yellow, would be number two under Raymond Patriarca and second most powerful person in all of New England. And some people would say before he started to unravel that he might have even had the same amount of power and influence as the Don Raymond himself. But Fat Vinny Teresa was his driver, and that's how he would have been able to make the connection for Richie Castucci and Henry Tomiello. So he introduced the two people. It was a huge opportunity for Richie Castucci. It was an opportunity for Henry Tomiello to make some money and to have a base of operations in the Boston area that was outside of the North End. Because at this time in the early 1960s, there was a lot of stuff going on. Henry Tomiello originally was Raymond Patriarca's underboss. But then Jerry Angelo famously bought his way into the mob in the early 1960s and paid off uh, Patriarca, and he ended up becoming the underboss and became um, basically the de facto ruler in the city of Boston while Raymond ruled all of New England from Providence. So not only would Henry Tom Yellow make a little bit of money from this arrangement, but he would have a home base of operations when he would travel up to Boston. He was having more and more business dealings in Boston, and I think necessarily he maybe didn't trust Jerry Angelo as much, uh, wanted to kind of keep an eye on him and not be right underneath his thumb, and Jerry Angelo's sphere of influence was heavy in the North End. That was his neighborhood. So Henry Tamiello would have a base of operations via Via Beach. So he sat down, he met with Richie Castucci, his uncle Arthur Ventola, who was, like I know, like I said, a well-known player in the area, um, had all types of connections. They agreed on, I think it was something around like $1,000 a month in some sort of percentage of the overall take of the bar. And Henry Tamiello would have his own area to conduct business. And this was like a license to print money for Richie Castucci. When people found out that Tom Yellow had endorsed him and put his stamp on the Ebb Tide Lounge, this made this place 10 times more popular. Anybody who was anybody wanted to be seen there. They wanted to be rubbing elbows. They wanted to be close to powerful people like Tom Yellow, who was a real mover and shaker in the underworld. And... Like I said, this was just like a license to print money for Richie Castucci. They sat down, he talked to Joe Barbosa, and like I said, Joe Barbosa respected few people, and Henry Tomiello was one of them. He looked up to him almost like a sense of a father figure. He respected the guy. Basically an almost unparalleled level. Maybe like James Buddy McLean was one of the few other guys. But that was like a different admiration that um, Joe Barbosa had for Buddy McLean. That was more of a peer like they were peers um and he admired him for being like a tough street guy but it was like a, like i said he looked up to tom yellow almost like the father figure that he always wanted and never had he had like a real mistrust for authority and strong male figures but um but bob also loved tom yellow and, and unfortunately for henry tom yellow like i said in the late 1950s early 1960s he was at the peak of his power he was the second most powerful person and the whole of new england one of the most powerful people honestly uh, in the country had connections to the new york commission he was originally from detroit but his unraveling was the likes of joe barbosa and his driver vinnie Teresa who had unfortunately become number one and number two in the newly formed Witness Protection Program. But that would become later. So like I said, throughout the late 1950s, early 1960s, the Ebb Tide Lounge was swinging. Um, it was where everybody wanted to be seen. 
there was a lot of money coming in, but then through the mid 1960s, it was just starting to get like a reputation. All of Revere Beach was getting a tough reputation for basically being a mob hangout. There's a lot of crime going on, a lot of scheming going on. The cops, the MDC cops, the Metropolitan Police of the Boston, I've talked about it before, they used to be an MDC Metropolitan Police Force in Boston, no longer exists. But they were always at uh, the Uptide Lounge, breaking up fights, arresting people, watching people, surveilling people. The Ebb Tide was a hub for criminal activity. There was all types of conspiracies and schemes being hatched up underneath the roof and between the walls of the Ebb Tide. And one of the most infamous crimes in the city of Boston would end up taking Henry Tamiello off the street for good was hatched at the Ebb Tide. And it was taken under by Joe Barbosa and his East Boston gang. They were going to take out this notorious thief from Chelsea named Teddy Deegan. Uh, his best friend, Jimmy the Bear. Flemmy was having beef with this guy, Teddy Deegan. Um, they were going back and forth. And it was basically one of the two of these guys was going to have to go. So under the guise of a robbery um, at a bank in downtown Chelsea, they lured Teddy Deegan into an alleyway where he was uh, executed. Um, then Joe Barbosa, after a whole bunch of stuff happened, uh, basically his East Boston gang got too big for their britches. Um, they were starting to rival power of the Italian mafia. They were uh, taking over bookies and basically uh, for a number of reasons they had to go. So while Joe Barbosa was in jail on a parole violation, they started taking out members of his crew one by one. Um, they had raised almost, they had raised like over eighty thousand dollars of his hundred thousand dollar bail, and two of his members went to a North End bar, like a couple dum dums, bringing the all the money that they had on their person. They were executed. The money was taken. And as soon as that happened, this pushed Joe over the edge, and he became an informant. And he went on a personal vendetta to take out everybody in the Italian Mafia. And one of those people was his former surrogate father, the man he looked up to and respected so much, Henry the referee, Tamiello. And he concocted this story and perjured himself and put four innocent men in on this crime who had absolutely nothing to do with it. Uh, the FBI knew about this the whole time, withheld evidence. Uh, they went forward. They with a trial against these four innocent men who had nothing to do with this crime. They were convicted of the murder of Teddy Deegan. Two of the men were sentenced to death, two of them to life in prison. Uh, the two men who ended up being sentenced to death in the 1980s, Massachusetts uh, repealed the death penalty, so they were resentenced to life in prison. Uh, Louis Greco and Henry Tamiello ended up dying in prison. And then, of course, in the early 2000s, uh, Joe Salvati and Peter Lamone were released when the federal government finally came clean and honest about the fact that Joe Barbosa lied and purged himself and made all this up and that the government knew it the whole time. But this whole scheme, crime, conspiracy was hatched at the ebb tide, was planned, executed. They left, committed it, and came back on the same night that uh, Teddy Deegan was murdered. This was a watershed moment in the Boston underworld and it changed the Boston Mafia forever. And Henry Tomiello was disgraced after all this happened. The guy that he sponsored and said, he's okay, he's with me, Joe Barbosa, ended up putting him in prison originally for the death penalty and, and eventually died in prison when he was resentenced to life in prison. But he became the first person the witness protection program was started because Joe Barbosa, he was the first person ever in the witness protection program. And he basically like just had a personal vendetta against the Italian mafia and purged himself and used the federal government as a weapon because he was in prison. And he had no recourse against them except to become an informant and perjure himself. And also his driver, uh, his other like the closest person to him. Vinnie Teresa would become number two when he eventually turned and became state's evidence and became number two in the witness protection program. So this completely discredited Tommy Yellow. Um, he was, like I said, the second most powerful person. Some people say that he had just as much power as Raymond. So one of the most powerful mafia people in the whole country. And then he ends up dying in prison, um, stripped of almost all his power and respect. So kind of a sad ending to the story of Henry Tamiello, but if you kids are paying attention, crime don't pay. 
So after the 1960s with the Irish gang war that happened between Charlestown and Somerville and all the stuff with Joe Barbosa, him turning informant and basically the Italian mafia wiping out his East Boston crew. I made videos about it on in the past. Like The underworld of Boston was completely different and restructured after the 1960s. And one of the emerging groups out of the Boston underworld to come out on top was Winter Hill out of Somerville. And after the 1960s, they were the second most powerful entity after the Italian Mafia. So throughout the 1960s and the conflict between Winter Hill and Charlestown, Winter Hill and Somerville aligns themselves with the Italian Mafia and Ram Patriarca. And through their alliance, the Italian Mafia throws their support behind Winter Hill and tips the balance in the war. And Winter Hill ends up becoming the victor into the victor the spoils. And after the 1960s, the underworld is kind of completely restructured and looks completely different than it did before the 1960s. And Winter Hill is the number two most powerful entity underneath the Italian Mafia. And they are closely aligned with one another. And they're basically working hand in hand to control the rackets in the city of Boston and the whole metro area. So going into the late 1960s, Richard Castucci has lost his protector in Henry Tom Yellow, who's locked up and he's become discredited due to the likes of Barbosa and Teresa. So he's looking for new underworld protectors and he starts to align himself and has more dealings with the guys in Winter Hill. Um, and by the late 1960s, the Uptide Lounge has gotten a bad reputation. It's getting all these bad press with the Teddy Deegan things and all the wise guys that are hanging out there. So Richie Castucci tries to change the name of the Uptide Lounge to the Beach Ball. Um, I think it was 1968 or 1969 to try to, you know give it a fresh face but it had the reputation it had and by this point Revere Beach at least at nighttime is a known place for mobsters and wise guys and it's not a very fun family place to be it's got a much rougher seedier element uh, so Castucci is branching out into other businesses he was very instrumental in bringing topless dancing into the city of Revere so Mr. Castucci introduced uh, the topless entertainment industry into the city of Revere in the form of the Squire, which I still think is operating today. I think the Squire um, survived COVID. Let me know. Uh, I haven't been there in quite some time. I think the last time I was there was for a friend's bachelor party when I was in my early 20s. But um, if getting a lap dance is your thing, then you can thank Mr. Castucci because he brought this entertainment into uh, the city of Revere. So although Castucci was involved in the underworld and bookmaking and the juice loan racket, he was a very successful, legitimate businessman. He was a bit of a visionary. He knew that the only type of these establishments that people could go for topless dancing or, you know, um, adult entertainment was into the CD combat zone section of Boston. And that was a really sketchy place. A lot of people didn't want to go there. It wasn't safe. So to open up an establishment like this out in Revere and Revere Beach where there was nothing else like this around it, he knew people would be coming in droves and it would be a huge money maker. And initially he was a little bit short on the money that he needed to open up this uh, business. So he approached uh, John Moderano and he tried to secure a loan from uh, John and Jim Moderano and Joe McDonald. I think and eventually he didn't need the loan. He tried to uh, to back out of the deal, but they desperately wanted to get in. They desperately wanted a piece of this new Squire Lounge because they knew it was going to be a huge money maker, and there was nothing else like it around. I've read that the Moderanos and McDonald were able to scratch up twenty five thousand dollars and loan it to Castucci because they desperately wanted to own a piece of the Squire Lounge because they knew what a money maker it would be. I don't know exactly. Um, what percent of the business they owned, but they had some sort of uh, legitimate investment into the Squire Lounge. But like I said, so the Winter Hill, they were, by the 1970s, they were the second strongest entity behind the Italian Mafia, and they were very closely aligned. But one thing about Winter Hill is they sucked at making money. These guys were probably some of the worst bookmakers on the East Coast. They were losing so much money through sports betting and their bookmaking rackets, they just were not very good at making money. So they ended up getting like deep in the hole. They're borrowing money from Angelo in the North End. They end up, um, it was originally through Angelo Sonny Macario, who was a made member of the Patriarca family. They made a connection with this guy, 
who is a made member of the Colombo family in New York. The FBI goes through such great lengths to protect the identity of this person. They throw whole families under the bus uh, and thousands of criminals under the bus uh, for, you know, cooperating. But they go through such great lengths um, to hide the identity of whoever this New York mafia connection that Winter Hill had in New York. He's only known as, with quotation marks, Jack. Uh, last name unknown. So the FBI office has gone through great lengths to protect the information this guy, even, you know, f- close to 50 years after the fact. You can't find out who this guy is. So they made the connection through Sonny Mercurio. Uh, they started borrowing large sums of money from Jack from New York, upwards to four hundred thousands of dollars. And they made Richie Castucci. He ended up being like the their Aaron person. Um, he was the go-between between New York. It was originally made through Sonny Macario, but they were having the payments being delivered back and forth through New York City from by Richie Castucci. You might think, like, why is a guy like Castucci bringing the payments back and forth from New York? But it would seem like he's found himself in not that great of a situation here. He's kind of indebted to Winter Hill. He needs these guys. These guys are his protectors. I mean, he's a high roller. Um, he's in a legitimate world. He obviously is involved in illegal things. He's loaning people money. <clears throat> he's big into illegal gambling, but he's a legitimate businessman and he's a high roller and he needs the protection of uh, rough guys in the underworld. And Winter Hill's pedigree in Boston and around is, you know, they're, they're the muscle guys. Like I said, these guys were not very good at making money. And Julo in the North End was making money hand over fist. But uh, Winter Hill, these guys were like the muscle guys. If you needed some heavy lifting done, they were the guys to do it for you. So Castucci is finding himself in kind of a spot where he needs to basically do stuff that he probably he's probably not too psyched about driving back and forth with large sums of money to New York and dealing with uh, get the in between between Boston organized crime and New York organized crime. But the guy's kind of got a little choice. He basically has to do what Winter Hill wants him to do um, because there is muscle, there is protector. So while this was going on, two of the more notorious members of the Winter Hill, um, Jimmy Sims and Joe McDonald, these guys were like frickin' frack. Joe McDonald, of course, is one of the most notorious triggermen and assassins in Boston, and really not the East Coast. Um, And Jimmy Sims was like one of the best getaway drivers in the city of Boston. Um, He would always be the wheelman on these notorious hits, and Joe McDonald, when he was around, he was the triggerman usually. Between him and John Mortarano, these guys were two like the notorious hitman in the city of Boston and for Winter Hill. And these two guys found them si- found these guys found themselves fugitives in the 1970s as part of the Molesworth stamp case. Uh, they were involved in a theft of a large value of stamps, rare stamps. And they were on the lam and there was a couple people that were forming to become witnesses against them. So uh, their allies in the Winter Hill were trying to locate these guys. One of them was named Michael Kersner, was a guy who lived in my city in Gloucester. And uh, he owned a uh, jewelry shop of some sort in, uh, in the Boston area. So while he was driving back and forth, um, they camped out and they were doing surveillance on him. And Whitey and Stevie were in like a car parked like over by where Route 1 and 128 connect as he's driving back to Gloucester from Boston and they got the radio car. I believe it was from Howie the name was redacted. When a name's redacted in these things, uh, whether it's like the Rifleman or the Hitman or any of these FBI files where it's like Flemmy and Bulger and Moderano were all informants. Um, Joe McDonald, uh, basically... Almost any time, what I'm getting at, any time you see a name redacted on these files, it's most likely Howie Winter. This is one name that these guys, they didn't mind telling on each other, like Stevie and Moderano and all these guys, but they never told on Howie Winter. And I think that says something about who like Howie Winter was. But anyways, so they end up getting the radio call that this Kersner guy is driving on the highway. Uh, he's about to pass them. Whitey and Stevie pull out behind him with a... Uh, Stevie's favorite weapon, the M1 uh, rifle that he used in the Korean War uh, when he was a soldier in the U.S. Army. Uh, they end up taking a shot at this guy, but the gun at the carbine ends up jamming so they don't get him. Um, and then they find out about another witness that's going to testify against Joe McDonald and Jimmy Sims, and he's out in Sierra Madre, California. They track him down, and Joe McDonald, they're like staking it out. They see the guy out on the front lawn in front of his family. Joe McDonald jumps out of the car 
in front of a horrified Jimmy Sims, walks up to the guy and guns him down on his front lawn in front of his family and other witnesses, jumps back in the car. Jimmy Sims is like so disgusted, so upset. He said, you know, McDonald's like losing it. He's getting reckless. He's doing these crazy things. I want nothing to do with this guy anymore. So meantime, while all this is going on, they're trying to find a place, like a safe house for these guys to hide out uh, while they can eliminate any more witnesses in this case and make this case go away for them. So John Moderano reaches out to his New York contact, Jack, and the Colombo family and asks him, is there an apartment in New York City that you can get for these guys where they can hide out and be safe for a while? So Moderano uh, talks to Jack. Jack says that one of his friends actually has an apartment uh, near Washington Square, Greenwich Village area. In New York City, it would be perfect for them. And John Motorano also, he all, he wants an apartment for his friends to be safe in while they're on the land. But he also wants um, like a spot to hang out and entertain people and be able to go to New York City. John Motorano was like a guy who loved the, he loved the nightlife. He loved going out. He liked getting high. He liked partying. He liked women. He liked clubs. So he would have liked to go on to New York City and been like seeing the life a little bit. Um, so I think that was part of the reason he wanted the apartment as well. But what they did not realize was that this guy, Jack, quote unquote, who was a member of the Colombo family in the New York Mafia, made member, um, that he was, and in fact, an FBI top echelon informant. So the fact that he's asking a top echelon FBI informant to find a safe house for two guys who are on the top 10 FBI's most wanted list, not going to bode well for Joe McDonald and Jimmy Sims. So very soon after they're staying there, uh, the apartment's all set up. Castucci's still running down money um, from Boston to New York on a some, on a fairly regular basis. Um, they've knocked down the debt from four hundred thousand down to one hundred and fifty, but they still owe one hundred and fifty, which is a pretty sizable amount. And they're also into Castucci for a hundred grand. Castucci himself has loaned out a hundred thousand dollars to Winter Hill. Not looking good for Richie Kasushi to be owing that kind of money, uh, to be loaning that kind of money to Winter Hill. Uh, Winter Hill does not like to pay the debts back. So it gets back to Whitey Bulger through his man John Conley and the FBI that someone is talking to the FBI office in New York about Jimmy Sims and Joe McDonald's apartment. So, of course, this begins a panic with the guys in Winter Hill. They're trying to figure out what's going on. Um, Whitey... And Flemmy get message down to Joe McDonald uh, that it's not safe in the safe house. Do not go back to the safe house. Uh, they wanted to meet with them at the New York Port Authority bus terminal. Um, and they wanted to tell them that this is a legitimate sense of uh, information. They wanted them to know that it came from Conley. They wanted also, Bulger wanted to empathize, emphasize to not, McDonald and Sims do not, um, talk about the source coming from Connolly. They did not want anybody else in the FBI to find out that Connolly was the source of information of this that went to Hill, that he was the leak from the FBI office. So this is where the story starts to get a little confusing and murky. Like most stories from the Boston underworld during this time period, it gets twists and twir turns. Uh, it all depends on who you believe, whose word you want to take. So Richie Castucci... While all this was going on, he's probably starting to not like the feeling of pressure he's feeling about how he needs to be like basically an errand boy and a gopher for the Winter Hill. He's basically at that beck and call. He's hustling large amounts of money back and forth. He's loaning them large amounts of money. Apparently, he was starting to do not so well betting too. He's placing large bets all around. He's losing on the bets. Um... Things are not going well. I read as well, too, that he might have had uh, like a mistress and kind of like a secret family as well that he was trying to support. So this guy's got a lot of things going on, financials, uh, troubles with the underworld. So for whatever reason, Richie Kasushi decides that he's going to start working with the FBI and he's going to become uh, an FBI informant. He thinks that he can um, maybe find a friend in the federal government and some help. Because he knows that there's nothing he can do by himself against the Winter Hill or the mob or anything like that. He's just a guy. Uh, he's a high roller. He's no tough guy. He's not. So he, he basically 
I think it was he had no other options he felt like so he went to the FBI and he started giving them information um, letting them know uh, stuff about Winter Hill about the mob New York about their connections about the money uh, that was being loaned to Winter Hill and about how he was running it back and forth whether or not see this is where it gets confusing now whether or not he actually told the FBI about the apartment he probably would have known about the apartment, about Sims and McDonald. It wasn't him who found the apartment for them. It was Moderano, but he might have known about it. But it's weird, like in the Rifleman book by Howie Carr and the FBI reports, it's like uh, Castucci told Jack from New York about the guy staying in Boston. That makes no sense whatsoever. How, why would Castucci... John Moderano, the guy Jack found the apartment for Sims and McDonald. John Moderano asked the guy Jack personally, can you find an apartment for my guy's who are on the lam and they need a place to stay. Can you find them a spot in New York City where they can hide out? So where does it come? Why are they putting in print? Castucci told Jack about the guys standing. No, Jack got them the apartment. See, this is what I'm talking about. This is where you got to put on your hip boots and uh, wade through this muck and find out like what the actual truth is. I think what the actual truth was, was that Winter Hill didn't want to pay New York back the 150 it loaned them and they didn't want to pack, pay back Richie Castucci the 100 grand that... He loaned them. So they decided to like make up this story that Richie Castucci was supplying information to the FBI about the whereabouts of the apartment and this and that. Now, Castucci was an FBI informant. He did go to the FBI. They had a file on him. Conley was not his handler. His handler was another guy named Daly. But still, Conley, as an FBI informant, as a special agent, he would have access to the files. And if he wanted to find out if somebody was an informant, he couldn't. He would have access to that. Whether or not he did and he told these guys... That remains to be whether or not how it happened. They did find out that Castucci was informed, but I don't really think that that was like the main factor. I think they might have even found that out after the fact, and then they use that as like an excuse of why they knocked him off. So on the fateful morning of December 29th, 1976, Richie Castucci gets a call at his Revere house. Uh, he's summoned to Marshall Motors, went to Hill's um, headquarters in Somerville. He's to bring down a large sum of money to New York to jack to their connection in the Colombo family of the New York Mafia uh, for their regular scheduled payments of the large sum of $400,000 that they borrowed from Jack. They still owed him $150,000 to $200,000 and they were into Richie Castucci for $100,000 as well. So they called him down to Marshall Motors so he could drive down to New York as their courier and make the regular scheduled payments. Uh, he took a shower and took off in his wife's Cadillac driving towards Somerville. She told police later that he was last seen. Uh, he said he was going to Somerville to handle some business. So he drives up to Marshall Motors, goes into the garage, is greeted by the usual suspects. Um, he's handed a large bag of money. He is told to go down to Joe McDonald's house, the dog house, which is a couple doors down from Marshall Motors, the headquarters of the garage. Uh, the dog house was a staging point for many missions. They used to have meetings there, uh, concoct plans, like I said, go on hits from there. It was also where Joe McDonald used to have his uh, like week-long drinking binges, and then he'd detox himself on the floor. Uh, <clears throat> it was just a pretty notorious place, and it was only a couple doors down from their headquarters at Marshall Motors. Um, so he's walked down there, I believe, by John Motorano. He sits at a table. Whitey uh, Bulger is sitting directly across from him. Uh, he starts counting the money, and then, like nothing hap like nothing is happening. John Morano walks up, pulls out a thirty-eight from his pocket, and puts one in the side of the head of Richie Castucci. Uh, I guess Whitey flinched. He knew it was coming, but he still flinched as he was counting the money and then tried to act all cool after, like like you know, he didn't flinch. He was like, "Oh, I'm just uh, I was just checking my hair or something," you know. They then dispatched Leo McDonald, Joe McDonald's brother, to Leechmares to get a sleeping bag to dispose of Richie Castucci's body. And I miss Leechmares. That was a great store. You could get everything in that store. You could get movies, uh, sports gear, sleeping bags. I remember I used to send my little Greek yaya in there to get me uh, gangster rap CDs in the early 90s because my, my mother wouldn't let me uh, have them. So I used to like write them, write the names of the CDs down on pieces of paper and give it to my little Greek yaya, and she'd go in there and ask them for like NWA and Ice Cube and stuff like that. <laughs> but I miss Leech Man. So I guess uh, Leo McDonald went and got the sleeping bag. Uh, he came back and he was kind of aggravated. He goes, "You owe me six bucks," because uh, I guess they were. <laughs> this was not the first time they dispensed him to Leech Man to go get a sleeping bag for the same purposes, and 
they weren't compensating him for the for the six dollars he was spending on these sleeping bags, and it was starting to starting to add up on uh, Leo McDonald's bank account. So they bound up Richie Castucci's body. They folded his legs back, tied his but his arms tight to his body and stuffed him in the sleeping bag, stuffed him in the trunk of his wife's Cadillac, drove it out to Riviera and parked it behind the Northgate parking, the Northgate Mall parking lot next to an apartment complex, probably where millions of cars have parked uh, since and shaved up countless 80s. Um, and right after that, a huge snowstorm came and buried the Cadillac almost completely under the snow. A day or two later, uh, one of Castucci's close friends who actually lived in the apartment complex right next to the Northgate Mall where they parked his car, noticed his car uh, amid the snowdrifts and said, is that Richie's car? And then he walked over and said, oh man, that is Richie's car. And then, it, um, I don't know if he contacted the police or he contacted Richie's wife and it had been noted that Richie left and he had not come back. He's been missing for a couple of days. She hadn't heard from him. Uh, they produced a spare key to the car. I believe it might have been his son that went with the police to open up the car, which is pretty awful. It was it was a family member, um, and they opened the trunk, of course, and found the grisly discovery of Richie Castucci's body um, in the sleeping bag that they had put him in and stuffed his trunk. Uh, been killed by the Winter Hill Gang. Um, it didn't take long for... Actually, it did take a little while, because at first, law enforcement authorities thought that he had been killed because he was placing bets, um, bad bets, was um, losing a lot of money on bets, was owing people money, was ducking people. And that was originally um, what the authorities thought was the reasoning for this uh, this homicide, Richie Castucci, because he was, like I said, he was a prominent businessman in the city of Riviera. He was very, very well known. Like everybody knew who Richie Castucci was. Um, and that was the original reasoning for authorities of why he was whacked was that he was placing large bets around losing a lot and making bad bets and he got into trouble with dangerous people they started spinning the tale of richie castucci was an fbi informant and that's why they took him out that um, why he's contacting the fbi john Conley had informed them that he was working with another fbi agent tom daly he was giving them information on winter hill and the new york mob and that's why they took him out but like i said i really don't think that was the cause. I think that they might not have even known that at the time. Maybe they found out that later and tried to attach that to it, and that's why they did it. I think the real reason why Winter to Hill took out Castucci is because they didn't want to pay New York back the money they owed, and they didn't want to pay back Castucci. I mean, obviously, it would have been much easier for them not to pay Castucci back. He would have had no course of he would have had no recourse against them if they said we're not going to pay you back the hundred thousand. What's he going to do? Nothing much, really. Um, but they would have to have, there would be recourse against the New York mob, of course, if they're not going to pay them back a couple hundred thousand dollars. So I think this was like the real reason. And then they spun it after the fact, you know, like saying that, um, Castucci told Jack about Joe McDonald and Jimmy Sims being on the lamb in that apartment. That's ridiculous. Jack found them in the apartment for the purpose of them to be on the lamb. So that whole story is just kind of a nonsense. Castucci was an FBI informant, though. He had a file, and he was working with the FBI. He found himself, uh, his back was against the wall. He knew that he was not in a good position, and that this was most likely going to happen to him. What ended up happening, him being found stuffed in a trunk and behind the Northgate Mall. Um, but like I'm saying, the reasoning wasn't, I don't think that was the reasoning. I think that was just conveniently placed on it after the fact. I think that they didn't want to pay back the money. And we'll find out that they in fact, did not pay back the money to New York. The Winter Hill basically just played dumb. Uh, Columbo's contacted them and said, uh, I thought Richie was coming down with the money. And they were basically just like, uh, what do you mean? He didn't show up? They're like, nah, he didn't show up. What do you mean? They're like, well, he picked up the money here yesterday morning. He, he left Somerville with the money to go to New York. He must have taken off with the money. And so New York was like, what do you, they were like, this is crazy. What do you mean? And, uh, so they're trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and then eventually, of course, a couple of days later, Rich Castucci's body is found in the trunk of the car. So Winter Hill says that, you know, he's placing bets all over the place. He must have owed people money. Somebody that he owed money to must have whacked him and taken the money that we sent him there with. Or he went and tried to run off with the money. But something happened and somebody ended up whacking him and taking the money. It wasn't us. We gave him the money to pay to you. We don't owe you any money. So the guy Jack was like, what? This is ridiculous. Uh, 
we didn't receive the money. I don't care what happened to the money after you gave him. You still owe us the money. So they started going back and forth. So um, Winter Hill has no intentions of paying New York back the money. Uh, they took out Richie Castucci. As far as they're concerned, the $100,000 Richie Castucci was owed is gone. And the uh, $200,000 or $150,000 that they owed to this Jack guy from the Clumbo family, this also took out that debt as well. So they're contacting uh, Angelo in Boston. They're contacting the New England Mafia. I went to went to this or that. So they end up arranging a meeting uh through Angelo Sonny Macario these guys Jack uh, and some of his other associates from the Colombo family from New York they end up coming to Boston and there with the intention that they're going to set Winter Hill straight they're going to come and they're going to talk some sense to these guys and that they're going to get their money back you don't mess with the New York mob like who do these guys from Somerville think they are so they roll up into Boston uh to try to press Winter Hill for the money now, I can't wait to see the reaction for the story for some of the guys from New York that watch this sh my channel or watch my shows. And they're like, oh, the, yeah, right, that the, uh, the New York, one of the five families in New York got backed down by the Winter Hill gang in Boston. It's a true story. It happened. So these guys roll up to Boston with Angelo, Sonny, Macario. And meanwhile, Howie Winter puts the call out to basically... Any tough guy in Somerville, anybody that's even loosely connected with Winter Hill, obviously not like the internal like core members of the group there's like over a hundred tough dudes from like the Somerville Boston area all milling around Marshall Motors when Angelo Sonny Macario pulls up with Jack and a couple of his buddies it was literally just like one carload of guys from New York they figured that just the name alone of them being part of the Colombo family and part of the five families the ruling commissioner of the New York mafia that that just alone is going to intimidate these Boston guys from this backwater here in Somerville and if they're going to back down, they're going to pay him the money. These guys roll up. There's like over 100 dudes all around Marshall Motors. Tough, you know, street looking guys. And they're like, holy shit. So they walk in. They have to walk through all these guys to get inside of the garage. There's more people in the garage. Uh, I mean, they are trying not to act it, but they are clearly intimidated. Howie Winter is sitting there as cool as can be at his office and his desk, surrounded by John Monterano, Steve Flemmy, Whitey Bolter, his main guys, while there's all these other guys just milling around, like just staring dots at these New York guys. And they get the picture pretty quick. If Howie Winter doesn't want them to leave Marshall Motors right now, they're not going to leave Marshall Motors. They got that little trap door near the, uh, the desk where they used to leave it open. To scare the crap out of them. The ever-living daylights out of them. So they get the picture crystal clear 2020. That if Howie, want, Howie Winter does not want them to walk out of Marshall Motors in one piece. Then they're not going to. So the negotiations go pretty much like this. Winter Hill tells them. Like I said. We gave Richie Castucci the money. He was supposed to go to New York to deliver you the money. Something happened in between there. Either... He tried to steal the money and got whacked by some guy or some people that he owed the money to, whacked them and took the money. Either way, we gave him the money to give to you. It's no longer our responsibility. We don't know you. Ugots. These guys had sweat dripping down their back. They said, oh, yeah, yeah. okay, Howie, yeah, yeah. whatever you say. Uh, we, we can leave though, right? I'm telling you guys. <laughs> this happened. The New York mob came to Somerville and there was over a hundred... Street guys hanging around Marshall Motors in and out of the garage. Howie Winter and his crew is all sitting there in the office. This was all set up. They knew exactly what they were doing. They forced the New York Mafia's hand. And it wasn't worth them to come back uh, and to start a war with the city of Boston over this. They just said, you know what, forget about it. Maybe that really did happen. Maybe Richie Castucci really did steal the money or whatever. So the debt was canceled, went to Hill owed the New York Mafia no more money. They just erased almost $300,000 of debt right off the top. Like I said, these guys sucked at making money. They lost their shirts on bookmaking, but they were some of the most dangerous guys in the city of Boston on the whole East Coast. And when they had to pull their car, they did. And um, they shut the New York Mafia down and they owed him nothing. And Jerry and Julo love this. He's I love you guys. You guys made me look so good. He made the city of Boston look so good and so tough. He felt that this 
reflected overall to him because he ran the city of Boston and he, it was impressive uh, to the guys from New York of like what a tight ship they were running and how like intimidating and tough these guys were and they did not want to mess with them and they walked back empty handed and left Boston for New York with not a dime uh, from the Somerville guys. So Jerry and Jewel thought this was the best. Uh, they were already tight, went to Hill and, and the Mafia, but this just even secured their relationship just uh, even more so. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. This was just a great tale from Law from the Boston Underworld and Compass. Revere Beach was just, it's just a huge part of Boston's overall history and then a huge part of Boston mob history. Like I said, in the 50s and 60s, Revere Beach was the spot for mobsters and wise guys to hang out. We also talked about how Winter Hill shut down the New York Mafia. Some guys from New York are not going to like that thing. I say that's BS, but it's a true story. It happened. It's a great piece of Boston law for one day. Boston was the bigger, toughest city than the Big Apple. Uh, so like I said, I hope you guys enjoyed this. This was a fun one to make. It's a great story. Um, and I just want to say thank you to all my viewers and subscribers. While I was making this, um, halfway through the video, my last week's video about the uh, first Black Gangsters of Boston just started blowing up. It's like at like 15,000 views or something right now. And I've got over 2,000 subscribers um, throughout that video. I thought after I put this video out that I was probably going to break the 2,000 mark, but I broke it even before I've released this. So thank you guys so much, like I said. Be, with not even six months of starring this channel and I already have uh, over 2,000 subscribers beyond my wildest dreams, you know, we got monetized a couple months ago. I still haven't made one dime, but that's not why I do this, guys. I love this. This is a passion of mine. I love bringing you guys quality videos. Um, let's not let Boston's history die. So, like I said, hope you guys enjoyed this. Like always, make great choices, make good decisions. Take good care of yourselves, your loved ones, your family, your fellow human beings. Try to have a great day, guys. I'll talk to you soon. God bless.